Hello, this is Angela Anderson. Thanks for joining me for this acrylic painting tutorial. It's kind of a different tutorial tonight. I'm going to be showing you some acrylic painting basics and some mistakes to avoid uh, when you're using colors and mixing them and trying to figure out exactly how to match colors and also things to uh, think about with uh, regard to cold, cold, cool and warm color. Sorry, I said cold. <laughs> um, so anyhow, we'll show you kind of step by step how I work my way through uh, figuring out colors for paintings. And so hopefully this will be a help to you. I've got my husband, Mark, with me. Hey there, everybody. He's been in chat tonight, so we're. Uh, if you've got questions while I'm painting, you can ask those, and I'll try to answer them. Let's get started. All right, so <laughs> if you're anything like me, you have to have all the colors, and um, so I kind of grabbed all of the ones that are kind of uh, the most common colors that you might see in tutorials and things like that. And I wanted to kind of talk about some of them. We might not get up to all of them tonight, but at least kind of give you an idea of how, what to look for and how to mix a basic palette using just a few colors. So you don't need all of these colors tonight. I'm just gonna kind of start and show you sort of how I do it. So the first thing that I would do is make yourself a color chart. This is uh, one of the things that I did when I first started painting, and I've had this thing for years. I probably need to make a new one. Um, and all I did was go through and make a note of each color. I put them in the little boxes. You can do it on whatever you want to, but um, this will help you so much when you are trying to figure out what colors to mix because it all already will kind of show you how the colors compare to one another. It's And then you don't have to pull out your paints and waste paint um, doing that. So that's the number one thing that I would start with. I'm going to just tonight kind of start with a palette that I like to use. So I start with quinacridone magenta and sometimes you'll see me using cadmium red medium, um, but really you can mix a, a really nice uh, palette of colors just by using quinacridone magenta cadmium red light and a yellow like cadmium yellow light or medium and then a blue that is kind of a greenish based blue so like a uh, phthalo blue with green shade so let's start there I'll grab a piece of paper here and I would get yourself a notebook of some sort that's a water water paint based uh, notebook something like a Canson or a um, Strathmore. The visual journals are actually my favorite because they have a nice hard cover and they make it really easy to um, store. So I would get yourself something like this to start out with if you don't already have one. I mean, you could use regular, if you use regular paper, um, it tends to get really soggy. And so um, doing this is kind of um, difficult with regular paper. And I'm just going to kind of make a mess tonight. I'm not I don't really have a plan except for just to kind of show you um, some ways that I approach color mixing. All right, I'm going to move all these off the way. <laughs> We're just going to kind of grab them as we need them. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was going to put these out on my palette, and I'm like, there's too many. <laughs> I'm just going to I'm just gonna grab them as I need them. Okay, so one thing that um, that you'll see on a color wheel, let me grab it. If you have a color wheel, obviously your primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, right? And um, we all kind of start out thinking that uh, those three colors are all you need to um, mix what any color, any of the rest of the colors, but it really depends on how the red or blue and yellow lean. So each color is going to have its own bias, it's called, which will lean towards the color next to it. So they kind of like to, uh, let me see here. I'm gonna put out some of my favorites here and we're just gonna kind of blend them and see how they merge. So this may take a second. 
And this is about, what, a quarter or a third of your paints? Oh, probably, yeah. I still have a bunch more. A lot of the <laughs> other paints that I have in my, um, in my studio are ones that are um, mixed paints. So I'll pull out, you'll see me use things like um, ultramarine blue light or um, something like that. And that just means that they are mixed with other, you know, they're other mixed with other colors. So, um, so if you don't have that paint, you can mix it if you have the other. Sub right, paints. right. But, but it saves me time while I'm doing my tutorials to kind of have the colors, um, pre already pre-mixed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And let's see. So a lizard crimson is one that you'll see a lot. I'm going to grab a little bit of that. I probably should be using my tone canvas, but I'm going to just pretty much smear this paint onto the tone canvases as we work and see how it looks. Okay. And so you notice I really don't need a green on here. I'm going to go ahead and put a green down. This is the one that I usually tend to use. And um, it's thalo green yellow shade. There's a thalo green blue shade. But I kind of like the yellow shade a little bit more. And then I'll grab cobalt teal. Okay, I probably should have put those in a circle, but we'll see what and, happens here. And your preference right now is golden heavy body paints. It is. I prefer golden. Um, I find that they're a little creamier than the Liquitex. I do have some Liquitex. You can see some in mixed in here, but I'm phasing those out as I... Um, use them. So if you Our try to mix a sponsorship, you know, we'll, we'll talk price. Sorry. Okay. If you're trying to mix a basic palette and you start with a red that has a little bit of a orange leaning, so cadmium red medium is kind of a basic medium red it's fairly good as far as it it doesn't lean too far to the the um red or um the purple or the orange side it's kind of right in between i'm going to use different colors different paints here if you were to try to mix a basic palette using that red and say ultramarine blue which is very purple you're going to end up with kind of a muddy purple here. You're not you're not going to get a color that is very vibrant. See how that's almost like brown. And if you add a little bit of water to it, you can kind of see the base tone. And then it gets even worse if you use a greenish blue, like phthalo blue, with a cadmium red. And then you're really, really going to get a muddy mess. You're not going to get anywhere near a really bright, vibrant purple. And the reason for that is that this cadmium red has a lot of orange tones in it. It's still kind of a medium. It's not as orange as like a cadmium red light that's right here in between um, this and the yellow here. This is a cadmium red medium um, or cadmium red light, I mean, but um, it's still going to be way too, way too orange. So what I like to do is use magenta. What? Okay. Yes. So cadmium. I'm sorry. So phthalo blue. Green shade. And red. Are going to make a really lovely purple. And that's because they're both transparent colors. Transparent colors will blend a little bit better than opaque colors. And because they are far enough away from each other on the color wheel, they're, they're well, I'm trying to 
trying to explain this <laughs> in a way that makes sense. <laughs> Ultramarine blue will also do well with the uh, quinacridone magenta, and it'll get you an even more vibrant color because it's closer to magenta on the color wheel. So you're going to get kind of a violet color if you mix those two together. See that? I do. And then when it comes to mixing like a medium red color, we can get a medium red by using a little bit of the cadmium red light and the quinacridone. So that's why I like to use it instead of cadmium medium in my palettes. If I'm picking a two reds to do, I will do the quinacridone magenta and the cadmium red light. And that's all you really need. You won't need any other reds. Um, unless you want to have them pre-mixed. And I do sometimes use the other reds. Um, oh, that was pyrrole red that I put there, but it's the same. It's basically the same as the cadmium red medium. It's a good substitute. And actually I'm going to be substituting out my reds for the pyrrole red here soon. So just because cadmiums are a little bit toxic. <laughs> so <laughs> just, just to, for the safe side, for okay. longevity sake. I got we want to be around. We want to be around in our exactly. old age. So I, I got questions piling up over oh, here. Oh, okay. So. All right. So those are some of the reds. That's kind of, I don't know, reds to purple. Go ahead. I forgot the first questions. Uh -oh. uh, let's see. So somebody said that the uh, that the paint in their tube is getting hard, almost like they can't squeeze it out. Uh, what is the probable cause? It's probably got a hole in it. It's probably got some air getting to it somehow. Ooh. So um, I would check that, tape it up real good. <laughs> it may be just the tiniest little crack, but even if it's small, it'll it'll do that. Could just be getting old, but if it's a newer paint and it's doing that, it's it's probably got a, a leak. Okay. And then somebody wanted to know, is golden oh, as opaque as Liquitex heavy body? They're currently using Liquitex Basics, and the yellow shades are way too transparent. Yeah, the Liquitex Basics is not is not the professional line of Liquitex colors, so they're they're going to be a little bit less pigmented um, than your heavy body Liquitex that I'm using. It'll say professional on there, um, so we're not using the Basics tonight. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty normal. I would I would just start, especially on certain colors, you know, like the yellows. Um, you can you can switch it out. Also, yellow is just a very low um, low value color, so it's hard for it to cover over other colors. It's going to be somewhat see through, and to counteract that, you can use titanium white. If I can find it, did I put it out? I don't see it. Oh, there it is. I'm going to put it out on my palette over here. kind of wish I hadn't used my paper for my thing here. I don't know what I was thinking there, but... Do you want palette cam? So here's a little bit of it with the white mixed in. You can see how much better it covers over that, that blue. And then all you would have to do after it dries is go back in with another coat of the yellow and go over it, and it'll cover it really nicely. So even if you have those Liquitex Basics, you can get around the fact that they're a little bit less pigmented. Um, all right, so let's go over. I'm going to start doing this on the palette here. This is just an old one that I was using to show some blending here. So um, I I saw an artist recently that used cobalt teal Instead of phthalo blue as his kind of mixing color, he used um, the quinacridone magenta with it. And it really does make a really lovely kind of purple. Just those two. Now, you'd have to use quite a bit more of the of the teal to get a blue that was anywhere near bright because cobalt teal uh, is less 
uh, of a deep color than say your phthalo blue. So that's why I tend to like using phthalo. Um, it's just got a really nice deep color. You can always add a lighter tone to it to make it less dark. So here's with some white. And then if we added just a tiny bit of like a cadmium yellow light, we can get a color that's real close to our cobalt teal. So that's why I tend to go for the phthalo blue. Um, I'm not like trying to sell you paints here tonight. I'm just kind of showing you sort of how I approach my color mixing. A lot of it has to do with whether the colors are warm or, or cool colors. So I mentioned that at the very beginning and your warm colors are going to be your reds to yellows to greens. Uh, greens technically considered a cool color, but there are some greens like the phthalo green that I like to use is definitely a little bit on the warmer spot side, especially if you add yellow to it. So um, that's why I tend to like it a little bit better. You can always add more blue to it to make it cooler. So let's go ahead and go around here and we'll add some yellow to this blue. You can see how pretty the yellow, what a nice bright green we can get. So we can get a green that's almost similar to what we just mixed here with just the and I'm going to use the cobalt or the cadmium yellow light because it's even more vibrant than the phthalo blue or the than the cadmium yellow medium. See how pretty that is. It makes a really pretty green with phthalo green. And then the more yellow we want, the more. Now this is just going over basic colors for right now. So we can get a color very similar to that and very similar to our, our phthalo green just with our phthalo blue and yellow. And then if we want to do the magenta, which is, whoops, that's the wrong color. That was alizarin crimson, but that's all right. Alizarin crimson and magenta are similar but magenta is definitely more pigmented. It's more um, vibrant, and that's why I tend to like it. Alizarin Crimson is that kind of classic magenta that was used for a long time before the quinacridones came around. And the quinacridones are a fairly modern paint. I don't know how long they've been around, but you can kind of see how much more red. I don't know if you can tell that, but that... Uh, Alizarin Crimson is a lot more red than the magenta, and especially you can tell when you add white to the magenta. You can see that pink come out. It's almost a, just a vibrant pink magenta, per perfect magenta color. And then let's grab our, whoops, that meme yellow light, there we go. And we'll try to get an orange. The cadmium yellow light is a little bit on the green side. So it may not give us as good of a an orange as the cadmium yellow medium would, but it's gonna be pretty darn good. And the reason that I like to add the cadmium red light to my palettes is because you can see it's it's a it's a pretty orange, but it's still just slightly muted. But when I add this cadmium red light, or in this case, I've got the pyrrole orange, which is very similar to it over here. Um, here's the cadmium red light. Here's my magenta. So I've got my kind of medium red there going. I can get some more of that magenta mixed with it. And then if I use that cadmium red light, in with my yellow, I can get a really vibrant, pretty yellow or pretty orange. It's already almost orange in it itself over here. You can see it better, but it's 
just a little bit more vibrant than that magenta color was. And then here is that pyrrole orange. And again, I'm thinking about moving to the pyrroles. So the pyrrole orange would replace the magenta in my palette. Okay. So you can see you can really get almost all of those colors that I use in any of my paintings with just those main colors. Now then when I want to start doing things like browns and um, such, you can basically just mix all of them together. <laughs> like if I was to mix all of those together, <laughs> then you're going to get yourself a brown. Um, we got more questions. When sure, you, sure. When you have time to breathe. Yep, go for it. <laughs> Okay, so somebody wanted to know... I'm going to go ahead and just put my colors out here so I have them out. Do you want to go to palette cam or leave it as is? Uh, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first question is, Is can you mix CAD red light? Yes, that's what I was just mixing. Okay. That's Yeah, that's what I was just mixing there. Okay. And and then I had the pyro orange, which is a substitute for it. If you want it, I'll put them put them side by side here. Okay. Then somebody asked, "What is the most vivid red?" That oh can no! Can you mix it? I see what yes. she's saying. They're saying, "Can you mix it from scratch?" Yes. Um, I would say, well, let's let's try it. We can see if we can get it close. So, um, if you had like a cadmium medium, maybe is that what you're thinking of mixing it from? They did not say. Okay. So we can try. We can. I mean, you can see how we got fairly, with with just magenta and yellow, I would say no, because we got uh, we got here, but this is that bright, bright, vibrant color that we were going for. Um, so it's not going to be as vibrant. But if you have cadmium orange, you might be able to get something close to it. So let's try it with, here's our cadmium cadmium red light right here okay we can do a big swatch of it you can see how it's almost neon it's very bright so let's use some magenta let's try it just with magenta first magenta and a cadmium orange that's pretty close it's maybe a little bit richer it's a little bit brighter and if we keep adding orange to it we might be able to get it fairly matchy matchy there you can see it's a little bit duller but it's it's close. So that's with cadmium magenta and cadmium orange. Let's try it with the yellow. I would try cadmium yellow medium because it's already on the orange, has an orange bias to it. Just means it's closer to orange than it is to the green that's on the other side of the yellow. So let's try cadmium medium or cadmium red medium because that's what a lot of people will probably already have in their arsenal. And we'll try it with the orange, cadmium orange. And I'm thinking that this is probably going to get us closer than that magenta did. Yeah, that's pretty close. And it's a little bit brighter. See that? And then if you don't have cadmium orange, which, you know, I would understand if you didn't, um, although it's a good color to have, um, yellow, cadmium yellow medium. Let's put that one out. And then let's add just a touch of the cadmium red because the cadmium red is going to be a little bit stronger than the yellow. Yellows have kind of a low tinting strength. They don't just generally, in general, they don't um, shift colors when you're mixing with them. You kind of have to know. I would start with them and then add your color to it instead of trying to go the opposite way. That That's, um, 
yeah, see, there's our, there's our color there with the yellow and it's not nearly as vivid as this color here or the one that we used with the cadmium orange or the magenta. I would say none of them are exactly as vibrant as the cadmium red light, um, but you can get it fairly close. So it depends on kind of what you're going for too. You know, if you're going to be mixing the cadmium red light with another color, you're not using it straight, which most of the time you're going to be mixing it, um, then it's gonna, it's not going to be a, an issue. You'll be fine just using the cadmium, uh, the mixed version of the cadmium red light, you know. Um, all right, so let's throw out some of these other colors here. We have more questions too. Do it. They would like to know what are the most vivid red they could use. They're trying to paint a cardinal. Ooh. Um, I like quinacridone magenta with a little bit of the um, either either cadmium red medium if you have it. So here's quinacridone magenta on its own. And then if you use the cadmium red medium with it, you're going to get a really brilliant cherry red. And I really like how the quinacridone mixes with the um, cadmium red because it is, it's so vibrant. It really punches up and like brings out the brightness of these other colors. Um, you can also use the cadmium red light with quinacridone magenta and get a color that's very similar. You, can, you almost can't tell where one starts and the other one stops there. So, Okay, just two more questions that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, when mixing, the person says that they're, they just get a muddy mess. Mm -hmm. So okay. are, they, are they just using too much of one color or? That happens a lot when you are mixing the colors, um, the colors that are not, um, that are opposite on the color wheel. So the orangey red with a blue will create a brown instead of a purple. So if you kind of know the leaning of your color, whether it is um, cool or warm, that will help you tremendously when you're doing your color mixing. Um, and I would suggest doing um, a color study. So I would take some your notebook. Once you do your color chart and kind of get an idea of just the basic colors that you're dealing with, how they um, how they lean cool or warm and and if you have a uh, one of these like gray matters palette paper on the back side they have a um, color chart here that actually it's really invaluable because it tells you kind of where the colors are on the color wheel and which ones uh, kind of in order so when you do your color um, chart I would definitely lay them out if you can in order from your Start with your magenta or your purple and just go on down the line and try to keep them in order of their um, coolness. So, and you can tell the closer you get to the orange, they start to get warmer and then you're going warm, warm, warm. And then you're going to start to cool off again here as you come around to the green. And all of these are going to be your cool colors here. And really I include magenta in your cool colors. Although when you add white to it, it really becomes more of a bright, um, warmer color. The warmer colors are going to be more uh, forward focused. So if you like are looking at a painting and you're trying to decide, I've got some foliage in the foreground and I want the colors to kind of look more vibrant and more close to me, I will pick a color that is warmer. So maybe a lime green instead of a cool turquoise green. I would use the turquoise greens in the background and then your lime greens in the foreground. And that just doing that is going to automatically push anything that is in these cooler ranges back visually. It's just kind of the way your eye interprets color. So um, something like this, I, I save these um, and just kind of pull them out 
and check them, you know, check them out. And when you do your color charts on your um, board, try to. And I didn't do it when I did this, and I wish I had. That's why I really want to redo this. I kind of did it. I, you can see how I started with the kind of purple and went to the more um, turquoisey, and then ended up in the turquoise blues here. Um, and then started with the turquoise to yellow greens, and then went to the deeper greens. And um, yeah, so except for I did it sort of up opposite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't have my yellow in between. So, um, yeah, it, it kind of, yeah. So, um, but however you decide to do it, whatever makes sense to you, I would definitely make notes. I would take your notebooks and I regularly, especially when I get a new color, I will make myself these little note charts and I will mix up. This one's kind of messed up because I painted over it, but, um, <laughs> I will take and I will start with, you know, just like a, a series of colors that I know are kind of similar to one another. So I did my quinacridone magenta, cadmium light, naphthol crimson, because I wanted to see how naphthol and cadmium red compared because they're similar, um, you know, colors and to see if they mixed similarly. And they really did right down the line almost, except for when you came to the phthalo blue, um, they were almost identical. Um, alizarin crimson so I also wanted to see how I really probably should have had it next to the crimson the magenta but you can see down the line like this is with white you can see how different those two colors are with white um, mixing it with yellow mixing it with yellow primary yellow oxide white uh, phthalo blue turquoise yellow ochre whatever colors you tend to use um, doing something like this will be really helpful um, and it doesn't have to be like charted out really carefully like I did on that other one. You can just do it in a notebook. As long as you make notes and kind of know what colors you've used, um, it really is super helpful um, just to kind of learn your colors. And that's what I would suggest to you is just whatever colors you've got and you may not need to buy any colors. Um, you may already have colors that are going to make yourself a, a really nice um, palette and you may not want a really vibrant palette if you're doing um like a lot of uh skin tones and things like that you may not need a little like a super hot pink magenta probably not going to end up using it a whole lot uh in what you're doing so it also kind of depends on what you're using your um palette in in your paintings for you know what you're what you are painting, what the subject of your paintings is. So I've noticed that in all your paintings, you, you try to stay with a general core list of paints and work around those. Right. And that's just to help people so they don't go out and spend $6,000 on paints for right. one they might use once. Exactly. And also because uh, you don't, honestly, you don't need them unless they're a real specialty color. So um, there's some that I've just added to my um, list of colors, and this is one of it, the quinacridone burnt orange. Yeah, baby. That I really like because it's just very unique. It's hard to mix because it's 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 not like any other color that I you know that I would grab, um, not right out of the bottle at least. Uh, Ooh, let me see here what I'm looking for. Real quick to your color charts there. Yes. Somebody asked, do you suggest putting similar colors on one page like you did with the reds? On I think one? it helps, yes, if you do that. I really do. I feel like it helps a lot to have the similar colors um, all on the one page, and that way you can really see how they play off of one another and how they compare to one another. Also, um, I'm using a gray palette or a gray um, canvas today, um, and using gray for a background um, is helpful too. Um, the whites do, the whites are nice. The gray, what the gray helps with is um, with values. So you can kind of see um, if you're trying to get a dark or light color or trying to kind of match it up to a photograph that you have having um, a gray palette uh, like the one that I use the glass one here will really help you kind of when you're color mixing to get your um, colors the right value it kind of starts you in a neutral place and so you can kind of tell kind of how 
um, bright or dark that you want to go. So there's colors like Prussian blue that I use recently that are mixable. So it's got it's got phthalo blue red shade, which is similar to ultramarine blue, doxazine purple, and bone black. So you really don't need all of these specialty colors unless you're going to be using a lot of it and you really just want that head start. Um, I'm looking for it. Yeah, quinacridone nickel azo gold. So there's some colors like the quinacridones that are just really good investments, I would say, because they, um, they're really difficult to mix and they are really unique. Here's the Indian yellow. Now Indian yellow is one that I use also because it's so vibrant. Um, it is also one that you can mix. So let's grab that Indian yellow. You'll be able to tell right off the bat that it's a transparent color because it's not going to cover over that that we have. So if I add a little bit of white to it, you can kind of see the base tone that it is and it's going to cover that white really well. So I'm going to use a little bit of the quinacridone gold right here and see how those compare. So you can see that the base tone is a little bit darker on the quinacridone gold. And, but when I add white to it, it's going to get real similar to that yellow. And then if I added a little bit of yellow to it, it would brighten it up even more because this is a little bit brighter than the quinacridone gold, but it's a really pretty like basic color. And I think that you could definitely use it to substitute for your yellow oxide, which is a color that I use quite a lot. But you can see how close to yellow oxide it is. Um, but in its, in its native form or without any mixing, it's a lot darker than the yellow oxide. So I always like to tend to go for darker colors just because you can do more with them. You can always lighten them up, but um, you can't make a light color darker um, unless you add black or something like that to it, which tends to, well, you can make it blacker. I should, I, darker, I should say. That's not, that's not completely true, but uh, it tends to change the tone of the color, or the, the, base color. So let's go ahead and start with that. Actually, that's a good, so now that we've kind of gone through our basic palette there, um, uh, let's go ahead and show the quinacridone burnt orange too, because that's a, again, one of the colors that I've been using recently. So here's the quinacridone burnt orange. You can see it against that other orange there. If we add white to it. It suddenly becomes like a, almost a pink Orange is really interesting color. See that? And there's really no other color that we've mixed in here. You can kind of see that that compares to it. Now, if we do want to mix it, and if you don't want to have to go out and buy that color, and since I do use it a lot, I'll go ahead and show you kind of what I use to get it similar. So I use the quinacridone magenta as a base and some burnt sienna. And then if you need to brighten it up, you can add just a little bit of the cadmium red light. And then when I add my white, I'm gonna get a color that's really similar. Oh, it's picking up that yellow, but you get the idea. I'm gonna go ahead and go over that yellow area right there. Blend that all in. We're just creating a big muddy mess on this canvas. <laughs> but this is one of really one of my favorite things to do is just kind of play with colors and see how they interact. So recently I found that if we take the quinacridone burnt orange and mix ultramarine blue, which is a purpley color. The quinacridone burnt orange obviously has orangey tones. 
but mix with the quinacridone or the um, ultramarine blue, it makes a really pretty, almost violet color. Let me add a little bit more of the quinac or the ultramarine blue here. You'll see what I'm. It'll start to turn a little bit more purple. It's a really like good um, mid-tone gray purple. And the reason that it's gray is because you've got that red, orange, and the blue counteracting one another. And if you look on your, I feel like I'm jumping around here, sorry. Mm -hmm. If you look on your color wheel, you've got your colors that are opposite one another. Those are your complementary colors. Um, I've heard them called contrasting colors. They basically are the opposite um, of one another. And you see this a lot in like sports teams and things like that. So you've got uh, Lakers colors, uh, well, sorry, purple and yellow. Um, sports teams, these are, what is that? The Denver Broncos, All right? <laughs> Miami, Dolphins, so. Miami Dolphins, what colors are those? Turquoise and pink? Turquoise and yeah, pink. turquoise and pink, yeah. So, um, yeah, right here. They're a little bit split complementary, but they're close. Um, so it, what those do is they are really eye-catching. That contrast makes one another, like makes them pop off of one another because they're so vibrant and they're both um, almost kind of competing for your attention. And so in sports jerseys and things like that, they'll use like them like really bright and really like in your face um, equivalents. So you've got their yellow, say, and your purple. And when you mix a yellow and purple together, you're going to get a kind of a brown or a muted color. See how, I don't know if you can see that. Let me add some white to it and you can see. And that's actually pretty close to what we just created here. So again, these were these colors that we were mixing here were similar. They weren't quite opposite on the color wheel, but you've got a blue violet and a um, orangey yellow um, in this case. So the ultramarine blue is probably closer to this one here, like a violet blue. And so you've got your burnt orange is probably gonna fall somewhere in this range here. So that's why we're mixing, when we mix these opposite colors, you're going to get a really nice brown, which will cause your colors to be muddy though. So if you know that going in, um, you can use it to your advantage. And like in nature, there is a lot of those colors. So in our recent painting that we did for the, my group, um, my Patreon group, we're making this blue heron. This color is this color right here that we, so this color on the heron is a smoky gray, purple, blue color. It's like really odd color, but it's, it's that we used quinacridone burnt orange and ultramarine blue to get it. So, um, so real quick on that color wheel, do you have those? listed in your Amazon store? I do. I have all okay. of these listed. And I like both of these. I've used two of them. Uh, this one is good for showing all of the tints. So when you're adding white to a color, it's called a tint. So you can kind of see the gradation and the, you know, basic colors. This one, they don't have the actual colors listed. So if you wanted to, you could probably draw on here and say like, phthalo blue or, you know, whatever you wanted to do uh, on here so that you kind of know what your, you know, your red violet would be, your magenta probably, or it'd probably be somewhere in between these two, uh, quinacridone magenta. Um, your orange red would be your um, cadmium red you know, but, um, you could, you can also create your own, like I did here. If you did it kind of more cleanly on a um, palette, you could even mark it out. And I've done that before where I've, you know, done it on a, um, on a piece of paper and just kind of created my own. Um, and then you can mark your own colors for it if you want to. And then this side shows the shades and tones. So tones are like when you're adding gray to your color and shades are when you're adding black. And you can see like with yellow, it creates a dark green when you add black. Um, 
the reds are really nice with blacks. I don't tend to like to use black as a darkening color. Um, I like to use brown just because it's a little bit less um, in your face. Um, that was one of the questions I had on deck. Okay, good. Um, and one other thing about this this particular one is, that I liked is that it shows your um, your grayscale. So it shows you that your yellow is going to be a much lighter value. It's going to be closer to white than, say, your violet over here that's on the opposite side that's going to be closer to black. Um, and so you kind of know, and that's what I was saying about tinting strength, you know that your lighter colors, your lighter value colors are going to be, um, you're going to need more of them when you do your mixtures. It also depends um, also on kind of the strength of the color itself. Um, but lighter values tend to generally um, be a little bit, um, you'll need a little bit more of them in your mixtures to create a change in your color mixing. So keep that in mind. These vibrant colors like the blue and the um, purple and even your magenta, um, a lot of times you won't need nearly as much of those as you will your other um, lighter colors like your light greens and your um, oranges and yellows. So, so what better way to say I love you than getting a color wheel for Valentine's Day? <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> that is really an ugly brown. Right there. But it, you know, brown is very useful. So I am going to pull out my ultramarine or my um, burnt umber here now. And we'll kind of throw, there's our obligatory neighbor with this truck. Actually, it's his car he's revving up this time. Oh, is it? Yep. Okay. His Mustang. Ah, that's the next door neighbor then mm -hmm. across the street. Okay. <laughs> so there's there's burnt umber. Here's burnt sienna next to it. And you can see how burnt sienna is much more of an orangey red. That's why I used it over here when I was trying to create my um, QBO, quinacridone burnt orange. It's, it's really interesting how browns, how these, uh, especially burnt sienna, will react to other colors because you would think that it being a brown that it would make a really ugly color when you mix it with a thalo blue green shade but when you add white to that look at how pretty that color is it's like this wow it's it's muted it's really pretty it's not nearly as vibrant as these colors over here but look how beautiful that color is I use that color a lot on like winter skies and um, backgrounds of like landscapes and things um, it's just a really nice like go-to color um, also the other color combination that I really like that's kind of an unusual um, combo that you wouldn't really think makes the colors that it makes are my ultramarine blue and burnt umber and it makes a beautiful just like neutral gray and then if I want to make it a more of a blue gray I'll add a little bit more of the ultramarine blue to it and I can get a little bit more of a blue gray out of it. And then if I wanted a little bit more of a brownish gray, I just add more brown. So it's really um, like a warm gray here. Warm gray on the brown yellow side and the cool gray on the blue side. You can see that. Oops, I'm grabbing that thalo by accident. And just depending on how much of that blue you use, you can get all kinds of shades in between of brown and blue with that ultramarine blue and gray. And there's your black. You don't even need to have black in your palette if you don't want to. 
Yeah, somebody asked, why don't you use black very often? And that's why. I, I find that the colors that you can mix, um, if you can use a, um, a color instead of a neutral black, you tend to get prettier colors. I just, I find that they're prettier. Now, there are times that I do use black, but not that often. So here's um, one of the things I was gonna mention, is there's like colors like purple that are so close to black already that you can use those to kind of trick, trick the colors out. So I can say I want my magenta and I've got it over here and I want it, I want a darker version of magenta. So I'm gonna use a little bit of purple with that. which is one close to it on the color wheel. So I know that it's not going to mix weirdly. Any of these colors that are analogous colors that are next to each other on the color wheel, if you mix them together, they're going to blend really nicely. You're gonna get a really pretty blend out of them. You're not gonna end up with a muddy color. So that's one thing to keep in mind. You don't wanna to get too far beyond like maybe three colors or five colors. Um, and the three to five is kind of your analogous color scheme. Um, anywhere past this like five color range, you're gonna start getting kind of muddier colors because they're getting closer to being opposite on the color wheel. So that's something to think about um, too. Whoops, so there's our, it's a really pretty color there. So what are you mixing to do that? That was quinacridone, magenta, and purple. Hey, I have a note here. Too. And I added white just to just kind of show you the undertone, but you can see how that, uh, just adding a little bit of purple to that quinacridone, magenta, created a really pretty dark version of that color. And if you don't use too much of it, 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 it won't overpower it and look too purple. It still, it still looks close enough. Um, so like when I'm doing flowers and things like that, if I need a dark version of a color and say I'm using like a cadmium red or something or a, a bright cherry red, say, um, let's go ahead and do it up here. So like a bright cherry red and I need a darker color. Sometimes I will pick up black. Black um, is good for certain color combinations and and reds are one of them that they actually do pretty well because blacks have a little bit of a blue tone to them, just in general. So your blue colors are gonna look nice with your reds, especially a violet red like we're using here or a cherry red here, let me do this. Cause we've got one, two, three, four, five, you can use um, like a blue in with your reds, you're gonna get a nice like purpley tone. This is um, one of the things that I was mentioning before is you don't wanna get too far away from that. So here's like the colors that we very first were mixing here. This thalo blue, thalo blue and cadmium red medium. Here's your cadmium red medium where it would fall. And here's your thalo blue is gonna be almost in this blue green section here and they're almost across from each other on the color wheel. So that's why they're not making a really pretty color for you. And your violet blue is your ultramarine blue, which it's one, two, three, four, five. It's it's just like one or two away from being able to be a really good color. And that's why using that violet magenta color with either of these two works a whole lot better to create your purples um, then, and really uh, it's magenta is kind of right in between these two. So um, that's why this works with the ultramarine blue here and the um, thalo blue here with that, oh gosh, with that quinacridone magenta in between um, instead of versus the cadmium red. So I wasn't really explaining that very well when I first did it. Hey, I have, a, I have a homework assignment here. 
You got a whole nother what? I have a homework assignment. Okay. Uh, I have to mention lighting. Oh, yes. Okay. So one thing that I will mention to you is your lighting in your studio really matters. As far as your color mixing goes, you're going to have a lot easier time of it. If you get yourself, just invest in a, a light bulb or two that is a um, high Kelvin, um, like close to daylight bulb. So um, 5K is what I prefer. Um, 5 Kel 5,000 Kelvin, I think it is. Um, uh, they tried to put 4K into my studio. I made him take them out. He was really mad at me. <laughs> the, the electrician, when he put in our can lights, he was like, and, uh, but the, um, it balances the blue and the yellow light. So that your in incandescent light, I think is like on the 2,500 K, something like that. Like the, the really, um, yellow lights are, are in the 2000 range. And then your super blue lights are going to be up above 6,000, right? Something like that. I can't remember. Any, you're not helping me here, honey. I'm questions. Oh, okay. You're not listening to what I'm saying? Of course not. Okay. Um, so, so I think I'm right there. So we're talking about daylight colors? I'm saying your blue light, like your fluorescent light bulbs, are going to give out like a like a like maybe a 6,000K or something like that, right? It's going to be on that other side and then the the yellow spectrum light is going to be on the 2000 uh, i never thought any about any of this when i was originally like painting i did not think about light bulbs at all until i started doing these videos and i realized like i would finish the video and turn off the lights and then the painting would like change colors on me so the 2000 like, the 2000 to 3000 is warm light warm light yeah 3100 so to 4500 is cool white uh -huh. And daylight will fall in the 46 to 65. Okay. 100 range. Well, what's the fluorescent in? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Anyhow, so you don't want fluorescent bulbs mm. unless they're in the right. They I, they do make fluorescent bulbs that are in the um, daylight range, but that's kind of what you want. Daylight's got kind of that full spectrum of um, blues and yellow. It's just, it's just kind of a good neutral. And I found 5k to be like, right. The magic spot for me. Um, it doesn't shift as much when I turn off the lights and look at it in other rooms or in the daylight, um, your color, your paintings are not going to change colors, um, on you like they would if you, um, don't keep that in mind. All right. Any other colors about or questions about color mixing um yes okay go go for it okay because so, i'm pretty much this is kind of mainly what i wanted to cover okay I think, so so first of all somebody wants to know uh can you explain the color wheel more they've never used one before oh, okay sure all right so yeah there's tons of good useful information on the color wheel where's my other one i don't know what i did with it i had two out here what did i do with it oh it's over there on um, okay so um like i said the, the there's different ones this one the, the creative color wheel i found to be kind of the most useful for me because i kind of like having more options this one's got fewer color options so this one's got uh you know your color in between the green and the blue it's got basically the same colors on it it's just got kind of more options and i could i'm able to kind of mix uh you know match my colors on my palette a little bit easier using something like this. Um, one of the things that I would do, first of all, is just to take your take your chart that you've made. If you've got if you've made one, take really take the time to do this. It's so super valuable. Um, and then you can kind of take them and say, okay, my ultramarine blue is closest to um, violet blue and then see what your complementary color to that would be, orange yellow. So what color would be orange yellow? So the Indian hue is probably in that range. Um, and so you can kind of start to predict how colors are going to um, mix with one another. So let's try that ultramarine blue. With that Indian yellow and see what we get. We're going to get a green because they're blue and yellow, obviously. It's not going to be totally gray or brown, but it's not going to be a bright green like we got over here. And if we add white to it, look how pretty that is. 
that's going to be a beautiful like sage green that you could use for a landscape or something like that. And depending on how much more blue you add to it, you could get a little bit more of a gray or cool tone out of it. Because you're working with two colors that are opposite on the color wheel, so that means they're going to be opposite most of the time um, from one another in the cool and warm scale. And I think that that's one of the reasons why they create kind of muddier, more muted colors, because when you do mix those complementary colors, they they're so vibrant they just kind of you know smash each other out and it's like you you don't have um they kind of counteract each other so much that uh, their their main tendency uh leaning is is uh squash but look at how pretty it is if you add just like maybe just a little bit more of the blue instead of the yellow so this time i added more of the blue you're going to get like a really pretty sage almost blue, gray, green. Um, so I would say don't, don't, um, don't so, count out mixing complementary colors. It can actually be really beneficial and you can get some really interesting colors out of them. And they're going to be much more close to your natural colors that you would use um, in nature, in birds, in landscapes than a color like this, which you're not going to see unless you've got like a really bright, vivid spring day and you're seeing like that grass, like, um, but most of the stuff around it, you may see it like a pop of this color green, but if you try to do your whole landscape in this green, it's gonna look like a huge, Ginger Cook calls them circus colors. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that analogy because that's exactly what it is. It's like this, these really unnatural, looking colors they just don't find them in nature so okay. knowing what go ahead uh, just just so so why would somebody need a color wheel okay and how do they use it um and then also what is your favorite color wheel they want to know the name of it this is this that one is my favorite right here this um creative color wheel it's a, it's in my amazon store um, okay. and there's a small version of it. I can't find it anymore though, but I had a pocket version of it too that I used to take to my classes and I don't, mm -hmm. um, so basically it helps you to, to show which colors you can use, uh, by how close they are into the color spectrum. Right. Am I saying it correctly? Cause I see like arrows and words and stuff on there. Yeah. So. The arrows just tend to, um, show you kind of which colors are going to be your complementary colors. So the ones that are completely opposite are complementary. These ones here that are on this triangle are going to be your triad colors. So you'll see a lot of like, in, and if you start looking for it, it'll be really obvious. Look at a magazine cover and try to figure out what their main colors are. And usually one color will be dominant. Um, so you might have like a, like a lot of purple and then your text might be, um, in these two colors, or you might have a flower that's orange and, uh, you know, or, or, an, or a bunch of green in the background and you're going to have like a purple and an orange or something like that. And you can kind of start to see how these colors are used in design. Um, there's also what's called a split complementary, which it kind of leaves out this middle color and uses this color and this color and this color. So if you're kind of trying to say, make up your colors and say like, I wanna do something original. I don't want to use the colors that I'm seeing in an actual photograph. And I wanna just come up with my own color scheme all on my own. And um, this is a great way of figuring out what colors are gonna look good together. Um, so you know, if you use like this bright red and the, well, there's your primary colors right there. <laughs> Um, primary colors obviously going to look great together, but they're going to, um, you know, certain colors together also kind of signify certain things to our brain. So primary colors are very like kid like colors. Um, if you want something a little bit more mature, you might go with like a red violet, which is kind of like our, our, um, magenta that we added just a tiny bit of purple to. Um, so something like that. And then we might go with a, like a turquoisey blue um, like a cobalt teal and like a bright yellow orange, like a um, Indian yellow hue or something like that. Um, and what? Go ahead. Oh, I can say. So on the color wheel there, would uh -huh. you use the same zone? Like for instance, on the that purple color on the top. If you go down like three shades, would you select the same shade level on the other side also? 
as it's oh, color? Oh, no, that's actually a good point. So if I was going to use, um, um, I'm going to do this real quick here. I noticed that I kind of. <laughs> the artist can't. I, I can't stand it. <laughs> I need I need these to look good. I love you. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to do it. All right. So, um, yes. So if you're going to be using, um, using complementary colors or using these, these, uh, these, uh, this idea, you very rarely will you want to use um, three super vibrant colors in their richest forms next to each other. Um, so you're going to want to have like variation in tones. Um, just to make it look a little bit better. So what I'm saying is like, if you're using a, say we decided to do something with this, this three color theme and we're gonna use the quinacridone magenta with maybe a tiny bit of, we can use a little bit of ultramarine blue just to kind of make it a little bit more purpley. And say I do like a flower with this color or something like that. I'm going to want. You know, you just drive everybody crazy by just whipping out a flower that fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying to kind of do it faster so we have time to explain other things. Because I did want to talk about um, mixing colors to match too. So. Um, okay, so say we have like our main focal point color is this red violet. Then um, off the side, I might decide I want to use some of this orangey color. So like a yellow, Indian yellow. And what I'll use usually is a more muted version of it. So I could maybe make some daisies or something like that or some other colors over here. And it's not going to take away from my main focal point color. Now I can use a little bit of that brighter color. But if I if I use it more sparingly, it's going to keep your focal point on whatever it is that you want to be your main um, focus. And the other thing to keep in mind is that you can mix these three colors together, too. So I can use the cobalt teal and then maybe use a little bit of this yellow to make a green for our leaves and do some leaves in that color and now we've got our three colors even though we haven't used this color in its like um full form we've mixed it we have used it it's it's there it's just we don't have to use it in its brightest form and um if i wanted to i could go back in and like you know add a little bit of it but uh, it's going to kind of keep your focus on whatever it is that you are trying to keep in focus if we wanted to if we didn't do that so say if I did my flower in this and then I had my I know sorry and then I had my turquoise and had my I'm so used to doing it sorry you see how how more um soft and a little bit more appealing this is than this because we've got three colors that are in their super saturated form they're all competing with one another for your attention and we've also used about equal parts of them in our painting um, so if you kind of uh, just real easy way of kind of like regulating your um, 
paintings and kind of adding. So if this was like my painting, say, then I would want to add another, at least two more elements of this color because this is our main color. Um, it'll lead our eye around. So it doesn't have to be as big as that first one, but maybe one here and maybe one here that's going to kind of create this sort of S shape. And this one could be softer. It doesn't have to be the same vibrancy. We want the vibrant, the most vibrant spot to obviously be where we want the most of tension to be. Um, but uh, this can really kind of help you uh, figure out your placement of things and also, you know, like composition wise and things like that but um, also just help you to keep things a little bit softer. So then a little bit more appealing. And then I would definitely use the yellow with this purple too, or with this purpley color to create some other places in here that have some of this color. And, and again, like maybe three more places, something like that. Um, you could create a purple with your magenta and your teal. So if I ended up with um, see now we've got like some deeper color you want some deep deep saturated color versus some of these lighter color areas so that you've got a little bit of movement and a little bit of um, separation between your light and darks you don't want it to be all light I mean that's that's a look though I mean it, you you can it's your painting you can choose how you want to I'm just saying that when I choose my colors this is what I'm I'm thinking and I like to okay. find images that are a little bit more balanced and this one would be a little bit more balanced you've got some dark areas you've got some lighter areas and it kind of leads your eye around you've got these colors in different places um, I would probably move put a little bit more of this lighter yellow in a couple other places to guide the eye around. So I'm thinking I've got some here, so maybe put a little bit over here and that will move your eye around. And again, we probably need a little bit of green. We've got it in two places. If your eye sees pairs, it tends to like stop. Um, but if you if it sees kind of like um, combinations of three for some reason, it's a little bit more it's just kind of like the rule of thirds. I don't know why it works, but it does. Um, your eye is a little bit happier. So <laughs> it's just, I don't know. Don't know why, but that's kind of how it works. So, um, and I would definitely go back in here and add some turquoisey areas maybe. Um, it's not, I'm not saying you can't use just they're more saturated. You can't can't use these colors in their saturated forms, but you just kind of have to regulate it. Maybe let one of them be the star and let the other two be a little bit more muted. Okay. And that goes for any of these that you're doing. So even if you did like a complementary this way and just use these two colors or a combination of these two colors, um, you could do a really lovely painting with these two colors and white and black or a brown or something like that. Okay, and they don't have to be on the same level of the wheel. So like like three down and three down. It can be two down and five down. Or right. Whatever. It could be it could be here. I've seen no, no. ones that are due like this. There's some that are these are analogous color schemes. No, so what? any so you could do a whole painting with just these colors. Um, if you do a monochrome painting, it means that you do use just one color and use the shades and tones of it. So here's the tones of that on the opposite side. Um, so you would use black and white plus that color and I've done a few paintings like that. Um, so what I, what I mean is that if I'm going to come over there and Sure, it. sure. So if I choose this tone here, uh -huh. do I have to use this tone here that's three down also or can I use any tone in here? Like if they mix this color here? Right. They can... That's what I was it. just saying on okay. here. Okay. Yeah, that's what we did over here. We added white to it so that it was closer to this okay, color. So, so we used this color. Right, okay. yeah, we used this color for this. Okay. And then we used this color down here for this part, and we used this color down here for the turquoise parts. And then we mixed these two together down in here with some white to create some of the leaves and things like that. So, okay. yeah, you definitely use any of these that you want to. I'm just saying I wouldn't use them in their brightest forms here. Like, 
that makes sense? Yeah, no, no, I was laughing. I, was, I told people questions were closed because I want to eat. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <just start> <laughs> okay, so I got a list of questions I, I've written down. Okay. Here. All right. Uh, let's see. Have Let me you, show you how to mix a color too before we go. Go well. Go ahead. Go ahead. Have you ever used athraquadone blue? I do. Yes, I have it right here. Let me show it to you. I I like it. It's actually um, they call it a substitute for, um, well, in a lot of like your basic palettes, they'll have it as the main blue, um, like. Golden recommends it as their main blue, which I like it. I just, I, I don't know. I, I tend to like, it's definitely darker than, um, than phthalo blue. And it has a little bit more of a true blue leaning. So it's probably closer to a true blue. I, I find the phthalo blue is more green. Ultramarine blue is more, uh, red, purple, so I like to have both of those on my palette because then I can go much more I don't know, purple with some of the blues and much more um, green with my greens with the phthalo blue. It gives me a little bit more range, I feel like. The, the anthroquinone is like kind of right back, right in the middle of those two, I find. Um, so here's, the, here's it with white. If I can get some clean white out here. I don't know. I've got a lot of other colors there. I think it got a little bit mixed with colors, but did I even put it out or did I just put it straight on my palette? I think I did. I don't know. So there it is with white. You can see it's definitely kind of like a basic blue. Um, if you mix it with magenta, if I've got any magenta, it does make a really decent purple. I've got white in here, so it's not going to be a real pur true purple. Not gonna be as dark as it would be, but you can see you can get a fairly decent purple there. Your your teaching is just what like unstoppable. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get a, cram a lot of information. I into know, it. and and you're very very thorough. I mean, okay. you're you're an incredible All teacher. Right, let me let me stop then. Okay, so okay. the next question we have here is: Is there any specific color that you can mix with others to help see their undertones? So, like they bought a tube of blue yes is there a, a specific color that they should use to add to it so they can see the different tones i add white and i i do it uh with water okay. so it and they'll they'll be a little bit different depending on the color okay so that's what i did on my thing here is that i did it i did it full tone and then i so here's my blue i'll do it full tone and then i just take water clean it most mostly out of my brush and then use water and just kind of pull it down and that's how you made that chart and there. that's how i made my chart here excellent that it you kill two okay. birds with one stone and then when you um if you want to you can take it one more step further and add white to it and white will also help you see the undertone um now this only works on white paper obviously so i wouldn't use my gray palette for this if you're trying to see the tone of it and then if you're wanting to do white, you could do it in the opposite direction, maybe with the white. It will be a little bit different because white does tend to dull the color. So you can see the difference here, how much more vibrant that this is than the color that with mixed with the white. And I think you have a video, don't you, on how to make that chart or some kind uh, of a color mixing I did a chart? color on, on color, a, a video on color mixing, and I, I don't know if that was... Okay, I, thought that I, you I think had I a do. I did also. do one on in my thankful art video or in my Facebook group that okay. I, I did. Uh, just a couple more questions. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, umber and sienna, burnt and raw. Explain. <laughs> um, umber and sienna, burnt and raw. Okay, so the they're all basically the natural n natural colors. Um, I don't really know. I think that they're just the sienna, umber, ochre, all of that. Um, they're just earthy, earthy tones. And I, I think they're actually started out being minerals. I think they're still maybe mixed with minerals. I'm not really hundred percent sure. I know I use yellow oxide. It's the, uh, modern equivalent to yellow ochre. Um, so they're basically, um, the same, 
Um, but those are those are all going to be earth tone colors. Those are all going to be really good for taking your colors down a, a notch if you want um, to mix something that's a little bit more neutral. So whenever, like say, if I'm doing a um, doing a painting and I'm wanting to tone it down just a little bit, so maybe I've got a red and I want it a little bit more earthy. If I use a yellow oxide or yellow ochre or a burnt sienna or a burnt umber, if I can get some of it. I don't have any of that burnt <laughs> Where is it? Um, I can get a, a more natural tone to my red. So you would choose a burnt umber over a raw umber because of the tone? I like burnt just because it's a little bit warmer. The raw umber tends to be more black and it's just a little bit duller. I, I like the colors that I get mixed with the burnt colors. Um, you can always get a raw umber tone by adding a little bit of black. But you can't get that. I'm trying to find my raw umber here. And she's completely off mic. Everybody, she's digging through her cabinet of all her other paints right now. What? I'm just explaining to everybody that you're completely off mic and that you're digging through your cabinet. So here's the raw umber. And I think I started out with the cadmium red medium, right? Oh, I wasn't paying attention. I think that's the color that I started out with. So then I add a... Raw umber. It's going to be darker. Like I said, it's going to be closer to like a black added to the burnt umber. And I honestly haven't given raw umber a fair sh shake. I've, I haven't used it a whole lot. So it may be fine as far as compared to burnt umber mixing wise. I just haven't used it as often as, um, let me see if I can get something close to it though. If I use black, a little too much black. We got a couple more questions still. Okay. Go ahead. You can ask. Uh, somebody wants to know. Can you explain pigment codes? Ooh. Can you yes, do that easily? A little bit. A little bit. Well, I don't know a huge amount. It. I'm not like expert on that, but I know enough to kind of get by. The. Um, okay. So there's burnt umber with black, and then here's our raw umber. It's actually closer to that first color that I mixed. So you can get that, but if you, you add white to that raw umber, you're not going to get a burnt umber. It's going to be kind of this dull tone, almost gray brown. Whereas when you add the white to your burnt umber, you're going to get a much warmer, prettier, I find prettier um, you color. A, you have a color mix in the chart, tutorial. I do. Here. And you can, you can, uh, Oh yeah. Oh, you're t yes. You're yeah. Yeah. There's that's, that's an older color. I show. Yeah. That one that creating a color chart. Um, that's what you were talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Those were using deco art colors though. They're not these, but, but, but it's similar. But yeah. It would be the similar the thing. So you can see kind of how much more warm, um, and softer that. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> It was rotating on me. It couldn't hit the pause button. Oh, <laughs> funny. Okay, so the pigment codes I would suggest it could probably also go to the golden uh, website, golden website, mm -hmm. and they would explain those yeah. much more in depth. It says light fastness. Oh, it's not going to focus for me. Can you zoom in? Yep. Hold it still. Okay, so um, light fastness one. Uh, PBR7, so P, I don't know what that stands for, but the BR is the brown for brown or burnt, whatever. Um, so each color is going to have 
a like PB is blue. Um, the uh, PR here means it's red toning, red tone. Um, and then the the number is just that it's actual pigment number. So this this is just says what the actual pigment is in these bottles. Um, and I can I could not tell you what why the what the number mm -hmm. these numbers mean. I mean I don't think that they they just each number each color has its own pigment that we it's, we went to a to a special class from Golden and the PY they, means yellow. You know I don't know what the I, maybe it's pigment yellow. I'm pigment red, pigment blue. <laughs> Who knows? They're, that's that's probably what it means. Well, they, I remember we went to that class and they gave us a, a bunch of little books and things like that to right. fold out. And I think some right. of that information is in there. But I would suggest go to their website. They do have mixing, color mixing, right. you know, interactive things where you can do that and explain and a it, lot more. And the light light fastness, it'll see say one or two. One is excellent. Two is is good, very good. So I think all of the golden colors, unless except for their fluorescence, are at least good are very good, or at least one or two. Um, some of your student quality paints, you'll find your light fastness will go way down. Um, and then on the back, it'll show you how transparent or opaque it is. Um, the transparent colors mix better than opaque colors. So if you keep that in mind, you're gonna get a cleaner, prettier, um, more vibrant mixture if you use a transparent color versus your opaque colors. Um, matte and gloss just means that um, how shiny it is when it's dry, uh, thick, thin, uh, really for the heavy body acrylics, they're all fairly thick, low tinting strength and high tinting strength. That can be really helpful too, to know that this one, it, this one's kind of a medium. And then on our yellow, we'll probably show it's a little bit more closer to the low. Um, cadmiums are opaque though, so that that whenever a color is opaque, it gives it more strength when you're mixing it. So it'll, it'll cover better and um, it can, it'll be a little bit stronger mixing. So if we had a transparent yellow, if I can find one, um, you're gonna show your, there's a transparent yellow, and then your tinting strength is gonna be maybe a little bit lower. Um, Benzamidazolone yellow light there, and then let's see the hands of yellow. Well, oh, this one doesn't say, but to, here's your tinting strength, it doesn't say, but very low on that one and that one is definitely transparent so that's why i tend to not use the hansas because i mean you have to use so much of it to get it to tint you 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 need a whole lot less of your cadmium because it's opaque and it's um it's got a higher tinting strength so um and then that's i think that's it you, the main thing also is that um if you if you're looking for the reason that i like to use the colors that I use is that they are all like like single pigment colors single pigment colors that have just one color listed are going to be much more vibrant and you'll get less muddy color mixes than a color say like this that's got three you can see all three of those um it's got three different tones actually four in there um to create it the series number has to do with the expense of the materials in it. So a series one is going to be cheaper um, cost. That's all it means. It's just that the pigments that go into this are much cheaper than a series seven. These are going to be way more expensive. So, um, so your quinacridones tend to be pretty pricey. And your cadmiums are even pricier still, I think. Uh, let me see if I can find a cadmium, see what series they are. I'm about to Series cut you seven. off. I know, I know, I know. All right. So somebody wants to know. Hopefully, I, I know I kind of like was a little scattered today. I'm sorry. I hope that it made sense to somebody. They're <laughs> Series 9, yeah. So yeah. that's like going to be one of the most expensive colors that you buy. Cause that, and that's all that, that number means. We, we Just, got one last question. Okay. How do you organize your paints? I organize them by color. So I have a drawer for my reds and one for my yellow oranges, one for my greens and one for my blues and violets. And then I have one for neutrals. So all my browns and, and um, <clears throat> browns and whites and brown and grays and blacks go in that one. And then I have another one for metallic and pearls. So um, that's in my little drawer thing on the side, but in my um, 
on the side, I usually just keep these main colors that we started out with. So the quinacridone magenta, the cadmium red light, the cadmium orange, cadmium medium, those basic colors, the, um, the blues, the greens, all of those. And I lay them out in my tray by tone so that I'm there. I know where they're at and they're easy to grab while I'm painting. It just makes it really easy to keep them organized that, that way. Okay. But, um, and, and since Dave is back, Hey, Dave. Can you do a little splatters? Just a <laughs> special request for me. Let's do it. Let's do a little bit of splatters. Okay. And while you're doing the splatters. I'll splatter with black. We'll, we'll also do this. Some, ooh, cowbell. Okay, I'm going to have to move all of my tray out here so I don't. So you get paint everywhere? Yeah, I don't want to get paint all over my good. That would be horrible if I. And there that's we go. How, then that's splatter how you splatter. Everything looks better with splatters. Doesn't that look like a painting now? Looks like we meant to do this. <laughs> so we there love we, we love all of our unusual suspects, and when when one goes off grid for a while, everybody gets concerned. So it's good to have them back. Yes, and thank you guys. I know I always like greet the new people, but I have to say you guys are the best that show up week after week and that have watched us and supported us for years. We're going to be celebrating our third year on Patreon um, this week on the um, on February 1st. Mm -hmm. So it's just incredible. You guys have been so good to us. It literally changed our lives. Everybody who watches the videos, those who support on Patreon, even, you know, even just... Buy stuff through the Amazon links. Any any of that. It's purchases just, through the brush guys. We feel very humbled and very fortunate to have met you all and uh, feel like we have friends from all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's really I've, pretty incredible. I've got to give a shout out to this super chat guy. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Juwan donated and says, Angela and Mark have been a great company uh, since I started painting just a few weeks ago after going through some depression and from work bullying, uh, had to oh, quit wow. their job eventually. Oh, no. I watch your videos every day. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Juwan, for that support. And uh, I'm sorry that what you're going through, but yes. hey, you know, everybody's accepted here. There's no bullying. That's right. We, we kick out all the art. We police. do. We kick, we are very, very serious about kicking out the meanies. Nobody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no bullying here at all. So, very glad to have you joining us. So, all right. Thanks, guys, so much. And hope, hopefully you learned something with, from all my scatteredness here tonight. And uh, <laughs> You were just like a I, mile a minute. I feel you like were. I was a little bit, uh, yeah, a little bit ADD tonight. A little, little squirrel happening. But, 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 but truly, you, you... I had so much I wanted to cover. It was you, just a little your, hard. Your teacher and you just really came out tonight. I oh, mean, good. You were, you were just, you good. couldn't, you could not just say... Yeah, blue is blue. You just went uh -huh. in so deep; it was oh, hard good. to get you back. So good, good, I mean, good. it was. It was. A great... I never did get to actual matching colors, <laughs> so we're definitely going to have to do another video on that, um, well, on how I approach that. But basically, I start out with if, if you, no, no, I'm serious. I just want to mention it real quick. If you have this chart, if you've got your chart, this will go a long way. You get as close to the color that you think it is. And then you just start playing with it and you try the colors that maybe try a little bit of brown if you think it look, looks a little bit brown. Or you can try the color that's um, closely associated with it on one side or the other. So um, like a little bit more of an orange tone or a little bit more of a gray tone. And then if you are, are a little bit more of a um, purple tone and then if you think you've got your color close, then you add a little bit of white to it and see if that matches and usually that white will really bring out the tones and you'll be able to really tell if it's um, match spot on I don't worry about values until I get my base color mixed so you can always like I said lighten it you can add a little bit of black or a little bit of brown or a little bit of the complementary color or something like that to darken it up but if you can kind of get um get it close and start out as close as you can. And if you've got a color chart like this, it's going to help you so much to be able to match the colors in your paintings. Um, and there are tools on Golden, like Golden website has um, color matching tools and things like that. There's tools on the website that you can use as well. I haven't found those as helpful as just kind of playing with the colors. Get, get yourself a notebook and start doing this kind of thing. See what the colors do 
how they react to one another, and um, you will you will come miles with your color mixing. It'll it'll start to all make sense to you if it's been something that you struggle with. So so many practice, people practice practice. Yes, many people want you to sell that art that chart that you just showed. What? Many people want you to sell that chart that you want to sell. Uh, so okay. I'll have um, to make one and I'll sell it. I'll I'm going to sell it to the highest bidder first. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, this one? Yeah. This actual one? Okay. <laughs> no, but, uh, no, but one they, thing, they're saying making prints or something oh, like that. Oh, absolutely. Re- I, do have, I do have copies of it on my thankful, in my thankful art group in Facebook. What? I've made pictures of it. So Ooh. there's some photographs of it somewhere there. I think if you Google it. I did some art chats in there, too, about color mixing. I used to do a weekly art chat in that group on Facebook. So um, that link's down in the description if you want that. But uh, one other thing that I did mention, I didn't mention, when I do this color chart is, I don't know if you can see, but I put a T and an O next to them so that I can tell whether they're transparent or opaque. And that just helped me to be able to tell um, when I, um, you know, go to mix them. Translucent. Yeah. So... And that usually is, like I said, on the back here, you'll be able to tell if it's transparent or opaque. So if it's kind of towards one or the other, then you can kind of mark it that way. So, all right. All Hopefully right. that helped. Man, I know that was a lot of information, but uh, make yourself a, a fun, weird painting out of, so out of you, it, too. if you want a traceable of this, patreon.com, right? Traceable? <laughs> No, no traceable of this. No, but I may make this thumbnail. It's just kind of cool, isn't it? I don't it know. Is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Have a great night. I'll let Mark get some and, food. And Saturday we're doing a zinnia, so hope you join us we on Saturday, are. two o'clock. Yep, we're gonna do one of our large flower series. Like, I'm really excited about that. Like, subscribe. First one of the year. Good yeah, comments. like, like, subscribe. Give it a thumbs up. If I miss something or you have questions. Uh, you want suggestions for other videos like this and you liked it and want some other basic information about acrylic painting, um, leave me a comment down there and let me know what you want to see next time. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you on Saturday, hopefully. All right. Bye.